same tip. She's turned five. Wow. Well, this can't be here, can't be there. First John chapter two. I don't know if she was confused or what. Mom's not here today in the nursery. Nothing is the way it's supposed to be. She's just sitting there looking confused. I guess we could have let her stay. I don't know. You know, we get excluded from everything, don't we? You ever watch like Teen Sunday School and you see like the donuts that they have every week in Teen Sunday School? Or you watch the kids come out of junior church and they're carrying like Hot Wheels and, and Snickers candy bars and Starburst and, and that never happens in adult church. Whatever it is that happens in there. And then you go in there and they all have their names on charts and they're doing these games and competitions and it's like we never get to have that in adult church. And so if one of them rascals think they're going to stay here and get our preaching, they can forget it. We're not sharing. Yeah, out of here, kid. So I'm joking about that. But uh, we do need to, we need to have some, uh, we used to have some pretty fun Sunday school competitions. And I think we should revive some of those uh, in the near future. Let me turn my volume off on my phone really quickly. If you have yours on, you might want to turn it off as well. Uh, I got several calls while my phone was silenced this morning, so I turned it on. Now I better turn it back off, or I'll have to answer the phone while we're while we're in the middle of the message. Are you in First John chapter two? Let's go down to verse uh, fifteen, and we'll read a couple of verses, fifteen through seventeen, that perhaps you memorized. But if you haven't memorized, perhaps you should memorize because there'll be a real help for you. And so let's look at verse fifteen. The Bible says, "Love not the world." neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, Father, I pray that you would help us as we look at biblical separation from the world and sinful pleasures to understand it within its proper context, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, there's a message in between this one and the one we preached last week that I don't have time to preach uh, because of just the series on worship that we're going to be starting next Sunday morning, beginning next Sunday morning. And uh, because it, a series will never end if you preach everything that can be preached in it. And so it's going to be one of those things. I'm thinking about putting it in a special Sunday school class. And so it's going to have to do uh, not with just not only with what we talked about last week about separation, not isolation, but it also is going to uh, cover uh, what happens when there's a disagreement about separation. Like uh, we. We'll review here in just a minute, but assuming you understand what we're talking about, we talk about being separated from things that aren't holy, that aren't that don't reflect the character of God. What happens when sometimes even believers separate from each other about matters or issues? And what does God think about that? So I'd like to, in a, in a few weeks, like to look at that. I've found some really comforting truths in the Scripture that just really help you be settled and realize God's in control. God's really got things handled. Okay, we're going to uh, just review just a little bit this morning a couple, uh, just a couple of the topics that we covered as we got to this place in biblical separation. Today we're going to talk about separation from sin and worldly pleasure. Separation from sin and worldly pleasure. Now that's not a very fun topic for most of us because the truth of the matter is, is if we have sin in our lives, uh, it may be causing us uh, to realize, okay, this is a problem. But the reason people sin is because they like to. And the word pleasure is a word we like, isn't it? It's a word that's coupled with enjoyment. And oftentimes the word pleasure is, uh, has to do with the flesh or the lusts, the desires that, <coughs> excuse me, that our flesh has. And it's pleasure is something we enjoy and like. Now, let me just say this this morning. 
Uh, separation brings joy, satisfaction, and enjoyment. So the notion that we could separate from something that we would exclude from our lives and actually uh, be less satisfied in life for is it's false, it's untrue, it's a lie about God, it's a lie about godliness. But it's one we kind of endorse and, and uh, hold on to and believe just a little bit. And we began by looking at biblical separation, and we saw what Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6, when he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and he talked about that presence, his train filled the temple, and uh, he saw, when Isaiah really saw God for who he was, he saw the a seraphim uh, flying around and crying, Holy, holy, holy. Isaiah's conclusion when he saw what God was, was that he was undone. He says, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people or a generation of unclean lips. So he said, I'm unclean, I'm unholy, God is holy. Now, friend, if you ever really get serious about looking at who God is, you'll be afraid. When you really come to understand who God is, you'll be afraid. And you won't be afraid because there's anything wrong with God. You'll be afraid because it will show you everything that's wrong with you. And what must God must do. My friend, God must be holy. And if you and I in our flesh and in our sin were to be where in fellowship with God, either God's holiness must compromise or I must be consumed or destroyed by God's holiness. There's just no there's no wiggle room. There's no halfway. There's no, well, let's get God to you know tone down the holiness a little bit and I'll try to step up the uncleanness, you know, be a little better, and we'll meet somewhere in the middle. My friend, we don't meet God in the middle. We're either totally separated from Him because of our sin, or we are completely reconciled to Him because of the righteousness of His Son. But when you get reconciled to God, my friend, you are holy. And so when Isaiah saw this picture of God, he saw God high and lifted up. Then one of the seraphims came and they took a tongue uh, with a coal from uh, the fire on the altar, and they touched Isaiah's lips. And the Lord said, Lo, this uh, touched thy lips, this has made you clean. In other words, you've been cleansed. And now Isaiah, who before was unclean and was identified with everyone clean and separated from holy God, is now identified with holy God and separated from the unclean, from people who are unclean. And we keep reminding ourselves, and it's so important, that when we get separated from the unclean, and when we get cleansed, it's not because we're better than the unclean. It's because we've been cleansed. We've been washed. My friend, there is no arrogant attitude of superiority when one kneels at the cross. There's no arrogance. There's no attitude of superiority when you come to the cross of Jesus Christ. My friend, we're all coming equally. We're all the same. We're all unclean. We're all undone. But when we come to the cross of Jesus Christ and Jesus' blood cleanses us from all sin, we're all the same. We're all holy. My friend, you are a generation of royalty, a royal priesthood. You literally are what Jesus is because God gave you the gift of His Son. Made you what Jesus is. And so, it follows then, the next thing we learned was that we're called to separation. We're called to be holy. Whereas if you've been made holy, then you ought to act like it. You ought to act like what you are. If what you were was a problem, and what you have become is holy, be what you've become. A lot of believers just reject the notion of holiness, of personal separation. We want to be worldly. And my friend, it's not what you are. It's not what you're called to. So we're called uh, to, to separation. Uh, we, we saw that. We saw that from a lot of verses uh, in the New Testament of the Scripture as well as the Old Testament. And then last week we saw 
that separation is not a call to isolation. It was important to preach that before I preached the message this week. Because I don't want you to be confused. Last week we saw separation is not isolation. Uh, we saw, uh, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that we're not to have fellowship with a brother, somebody who has been born again, who's living in sin, gross sin, and they're continuing in it. We're not to have fellowship with them, but we're not supposed to go out of the world. We're supposed to withdraw from a brother who's living in sin, but we're not supposed to go out of the world. The Bible says if you're going to withdraw from sinners, you'd have to go out of the world. And there are believers who have embraced that nonsense. It is uh, it's laughable. It's laughable the, the idea of monasticism or monastics. Uh, having a monastery where men who are supposed to be quote, holy, they're not, but are supposed to be holy, withdraw themselves and live in an isolated place, a withdrawn place, so that they are not affected or influenced by the wicked. The problem is, is that there's more wickedness, I think, that goes on in those places oftentimes because they're wicked. And the, so the idea that, well, you know, we're holy, and so we can't come into contact with any people who are sinners, it's, it's unscriptural, it's unbiblical. And we're going to see today uh, from a number of, of scriptures, and if you would just get ready to uh, kind of go through a number of scriptures in your Bibles today, I just want to just look at some biblical commands about separation and about the way we're supposed to approach separation. We're not supposed to leave the world, but we are supposed to, according to 1 John 2.15, not love the world. And there's a big difference between being in the world and loving the world. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, it wouldn't be very helpful for me to simply say, don't love the world, but not to try to help you to know what the love of the world is, right? So, the love of the world is actually described in uh, verse 16. All that's in the world, and it's described three ways. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those three things. That's what's described as the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, I've heard a lot of messages, great messages preached, explaining what the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is. But I'll be honest with you, I think we could kind of just think for a second, say, what is the lust of the flesh? And we could answer the question, couldn't we? Man, I want it. Something I want, my, something my flesh lusts or desires after. And it isn't just fornication. You know, the New Testament over and over again talks about uh, perversion. It talks about fornication, sexual sin. Isn't, that isn't the only kind of the lust of the flesh, but it is a, it is a kind of the lust of the flesh. Uh, covetousness. Man, wanting something. Like literally setting your heart on something and loving something that you could possess which is not eternal. Whether the possession is a relationship, whether the possession... You know, you can't possess a person, but you can have a relationship. And some people have a relationship, and they almost think they have a person. You know, but uh, that the, the way that, they're, that uh, they view that thing is more of a lust aspect. Uh, it's more of a fleshly desire. This is for my flesh, uh, and that's in the way that it's fulfilled. And that could be. Uh, but it's, oftentimes it's objects or possessions. Or uh, sometimes the pride of life, you know, it could be an achievement. Does it ever seem ironic to you, the cycle of life, as, as you, you just think about it? You ever think about, you know, just, just the cycle of life? Okay, kids, toddlers, okay, babies born. Babies don't have a personality, we all know this. But they develop a personality sometime about when they... I'm joking, people, okay? I, I believe you when you tell me babies have personality, but I can't see it. They just seem angry to me. Uh, or happy, like have happy. They have two two modes: happy or mad. You know, one or the other. Either crying. I'm, okay, I'm kidding. All right. Uh, but you know, you watch kids when they begin to play when they're toddlers. I remember uh, when I was a kid. Matter of fact, in Kansas, I've still got my toy box. I've got my toys from when I was a kid. I have my Massey 
Ferguson tractors and my discs and my plows. I've got my semi trucks, and uh, I've got I've got a lot of those toys in Kansas. If my sister didn't steal them from me, she took a lot of our stuff. But um, <laughs> I've got my toys in Kansas in in a box, and my mom knows where they're at. I don't know where they're at anymore. But then I got my toy box. You know what I used to do when I played when I was three years old, four years old, five years old? Played a lot of times with cars and trucks and tractors. I never was into action figures. Those weren't real. I was into real things. And I remember driving cars and making car sounds. You know, I had my diesel sound. You know, and you got your, you know, your race car sound. That's a motorcycle sound, I guess. But I had sounds for everything, you know, and I'd drive. I would spend all day acting like I was doing what my dad would do. You know, my dad had a car dealership, and he would, we lived on a farm, I remember when I was three or four, but he would leave, and he would go into town to his car dealership, and he would work with cars. He'd go to the auction, buy cars, and he would uh, have his shop, and he'd fix cars, and he'd line cars up in the parking lot. So I'd build a building, you know, and I'd put a car lot there, and I'd line cars all up like on my dad. Or I'd get my tractor out, and I'd disc the carpet in our living room. And we had, sh not really shag carpet, but carpet that was long enough that it actually left the disc marks and I'd tell people don't walk on the carpet, I just disced it, you know, and I would leave tracks, I would disc the whole living room. And, uh, you know, I would, I would pretend to be doing what my dad was actually having to do, working. That's funny, isn't it? Is ever ironic to you that when kids are playing, they pretend they're working? We call it today, this is a really stupid word, but it's on t-shirts, so it must be real, adulting. You know, it's the word that people use today. It's a dumb word. Uh, it's a millennial thing, and they, they think it's cute to say things that sound stupid and put them on T-shirts. And so it's a word, the word adulting, which means I'm acting like an adult. I've, you know, I've been adult age for, what, 20 years, and now I'm going to, you know, take on responsibility today, and we call it adulting. Uh, but it's, it's, you just have to do it. You know, when you turn 18 or so, and your parents say, get out of the house and go, you know, make a way for yourself and send something home. You know, that's why it was in your house, right? <laughs> but, uh, anyway, you, you just you had to be responsible. Well, kids play at adulting. They play house. They play school. They, they do things that adults have to do, and they pretend they're adults working. Now, how in the world can that be fun? I don't know, but adults just can't wait until they get old enough to work, right? Uh, I hated school my whole life. I've always hated school. I never liked the whole sitting down and being taught concept. Now, I've gotten better at it. I see the value and the necessity in it, but I never enjoyed school. I remember being in kindergarten and, and first going to school and people would say, how do you like kindergarten? And my mom would say, oh, he loves it. And I always thought, no, he doesn't. He hates it. <laughs> I hated kindergarten. I didn't like my kindergarten teacher. I didn't like anything about kindergarten. I, uh, the only thing that good that happens, I learned how to read and became very dangerous after that. Uh, but the reality of it is, is I didn't like school. I never liked I never liked first grade, and I didn't like second grade, and I didn't like third grade, and I didn't like fourth grade. I don't remember fifth grade, but I didn't like sixth grade, and I didn't like seventh grade, and I didn't like eighth grade, and I didn't like ninth grade, and I didn't like twelfth grade. And uh, there there wasn't thirteenth grade. I graduated, and guess what? The brilliant thing I idea I had to do was after that, college. I went to college for four years. And I didn't like my freshman year, and I didn't like my sophomore year, and I didn't like my junior year, and I didn't like my senior year. And I graduated from that, and guess what I did after that? Two more years. Well, not yet. I, I, I got a job. I wanted, I, I worked there, actually got my dream job, became pastor, Fort Lauderdale Baptist, not Fort Lauderdale Baptist, assistant pastor at uh, West Park Baptist Church with the... Uh, understanding that I planted a church, which ultimately ended up being Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. And so I uh, worked there, oh, little, I guess about four years, and, and then guess what I did? I went back to seminary. I went to class and hated it uh, for a couple more years. And now I'm working as a pastor, and it's the best job in the world. It's a job. And uh, I'll probably never retire but I may transition someday. It may be bad for this church for me to be the pastor of it. It may be that I slip too many cogs mentally and it just is too hard for you guys to listen to me preach someday. 
It's already looking tough this morning, actually, looking at your sad faces. Uh, it may be, you know, whatever happens, maybe the, the Lord will transit. You just never know what, what God will do. But until the day I die, I want to I want to work. I don't want to retire. But you know, that's the cycle of life. People, you know, get raised so that they can do something, and then they, it's what they want, like anything. I mean, they kids, when they are in high school, they want a career, man. They want to get trained for college. They want a college degree, and they get a college degree, and then they... A lot of times they want a job, they want to work, and then they get the job, and guess what they want to do? They want to, you know, they want to get promoted. They want to climb the ladder and get to here and here and here. And guess what happens when they get to the top? Man, if I could just quit, <laughs> if I could just retire, you know, and there's a trend. I know a lot of people in their in their uh, late 30s, early 40s, and 50s. They're just quitting their jobs. And so, you know, I've always done something I didn't like. I'm going to do something I like. And they're just starting to do something that they like instead of maybe the job they've always worked. And uh, Solomon says that all that's vanity. He says it's the vanity of life. You want this, you get it, and you achieve it, and then you realize there's nothing there. And then you want this, and you achieve it, and you get it, and there's nothing there. And it's just, it's the vanity of life, but it's, the, it's in the world. It's the lust of the flesh. A lot of it. Even a job can be the less of flesh. This is what I want. And then the Bible says lust of the eyes. Man, it's things that you see, that you desire, that uh, please you. And then the pride of life. And, and really I think that, that ultimate thing I just talked about, you know, it is the pride of life. And there are people, I believe they work a job simply so they can tell people the job they work. I hate to say this, but this last year I talked to a couple of people that actually didn't want to do what they were doing, but they were working on achieving a status at their work for a particular promotion just so that when they went back home, I, I, I talked to a person, they're going to go back home and visit friends, and they wanted to achieve a status so that their friends wouldn't basically be more successful than them. Now you laugh about it, but you got a little bit of that in you too. A lot of people do. And you just, I want to be this so that my friends don't think I'm a loser. It's the pride of life. A lot of it is. And it's the world. It's what the world offers and says, this is happiness, this is success, this is, this is what we have to offer you. And the Bible says, don't love it. Now, you say, Pastor, okay, that helps me understand maybe a little bit about what loving the world is or what the love of the world is. But... Um, what is the, how is it I can know if I love the world? Do a time budget sometime. Do a time budget sometime. Look at how you spend your time. Actually do it. Okay, I don't, some of y'all don't know how to make a budget. And I'm not making fun here. I've actually realized in the last year, I've always just assumed that budgets are things people don't do because they uh, don't want to, but I actually have talked in the last year, a lot of people said, I've just never taught how to manage my life or manage my finances or whatever. So they don't actually know how to make a budget. Uh, you know, if you're just going to make a budget, if I'm going to sit down with somebody, say I'm doing premarital counseling, and I want to head off some problems that a young couple is, will have, it's, it's uh, one of the things they need help with is their finances. Because I'll tell you some people, Man, when, when you get financial strain on your life, it puts strain on your relationship, hurts your relationship. So one of the things that I'll, in premarital counseling, deal with is, is, is a budget. You know how I figure out, help a couple figure out their budget? They're, we just look at what they spend. This is what you make. This is what you spend. This is what you've done in the past. So you look at what's been done in the past. Okay, where is your money? <laughs> a lot of times it's, here's the credit card. Here's what I owe. It's, I don't have anything. Okay, but you look at what you have, you look at what comes in, and you look at where it goes out, and you really find out what priorities are for people. One of the things I realize when I work on budgets with people is that uh, people spend a lot of money on stuff that's just not important to me. Uh, I've never paid for cable TV or direct TV or whatever, and there are some people, man, it's just like, you know, cut that whatever it is out of your budget. Just cut it out of your budget, and I'll tell you something, well, I can't do without that. Uh, whatever the monthlies are, the gym membership, you know, that, that bills you 
every month and you never go, you know, whatever uh, these the monthlies are, the things that they automatically deduct from you, you realize, okay, I don't do that, I don't need that, but it's part of my budget. Your, your automotive costs, your insurance, your uh, housing, and all this, so you make a budget. So how do you make a budget? You make it on the basis of what you've done in the past, right? I'm not teaching you how to make a budget today, but I want you to understand time budgeting so you understand where I'm coming from. Okay, uh, then if you're going to budget your time, look at what you've done. Just think of it. Some of y'all, you, you don't know. I mean, this is, this is true of a lot of us sometimes. If you just look at how you spent every minute last week, just divide your days into increments of 24 and then subdivide those into fours. So, you know, whatever four times 24 is, you'll have that many categories. So go, what did I do this hour? Now, hopefully, you'll have some easy parts, like I slept. And uh, it'll help you with your budget if you slept like 10 hours. Then you only have to deal with 14 hours of budgeting. So sleep more. Hey, you'd be surprised at how many people waste their life not sleeping. And you are wasting your life not sleeping because you feel terrible. And uh, nothing, you're, you're out of sorts. It, hurt, it affects you spiritually and mentally. And you won't invest the time into sleeping that you need to. And it's affecting your life. You, you don't discipline yourself to go to bed and get up in the morning. And you're a mess. You're actually a wreck in life because of it. So you budget your sleeping time. Uh, seven hours. So then... Uh, you got 18 hours left in the day. And you ask yourself seven days last week what you did for 18 hours of your day and write it on paper and you probably laugh at how you spend your time. Just write it down. This is what I did. And you'll be embarrassed to actually put it forward into your projected budget. Now we make our church budget. We look at everything we spent the last year and then we look at what, what came in. And we just kind of figure it's going to be kind of close what comes in this year, what came in last year. And we just project our budget for the next year. And you can do that with your time. But if you did it, you'd see what you spend your time doing. Television. How much time you watch TV a day? This can be embarrassing for some of us. Just as bad, those devices. Media. How much time a day? Can be just as bad, and then you start putting things that uh, are important that have value in there, and you do a percentage. Do you know how to figure a percentage of your time? This is your hundred. This is hundred percent, and I spent this percent. Okay, so if a day we spend thirty minutes reading our Bible and uh, going before God in prayer and seeking biblical counsel. If we spend 30 minutes, that's more than most people spend. you know that? Mm -hmm. It's actually more than most people spend in a day. And you know that kind of shows that spiritual things are pretty low priority. Sunday's a good day for us, right? If we're in church, we get Sunday school, Sunday morning, and if you're here in the afternoon, go to Miami Beach with us, you get Miami Beach, and then Sunday school down there, and then... Uh, service this evening, we get a good chunk of time and things that are spiritual or best. How about soul winning? Telling people about Jesus. If your purpose in life is to be a witness and a testimony for Jesus Christ, how much of your life is spent accomplishing that purpose? Percentage wise. And you'll find out what you love on the basis of what you do. If you want to do something, you find time to do it if you really want to. I tell people all the time, I had a pastor call me this last week, and he said, so you live in South Florida, are you a fisherman? I said, well, I'm not a golfer. <coughs> you know, I don't golf. I'm not trying to pick on golfers here. Well, I am picking on golfers here today. You know, there's nothing in the Bible that says anything, or teaches anything about golf. Fishing's all through the Scripture. Being fishers of men, uh, being fishermen, it's, it's totally biblical. But golfing, other than having nice clothing, there's no value in that. You can't eat a golf ball. Well, you could, but you shouldn't eat a golf ball. And it might choke you if you did. Uh, you know, you just there's it's a waste of time. It's not even good exercise. Don't kid yourself about golf being extra. Okay, I'm not. I have no reason to pick on golfers. Let's leave that alone. Nice clothes, golf. They have nice shirts. Golfers do. But the pastor asked me last week. He said, "You a fisherman?" And I said, "Well, <laughs> I should be. <laughs> I want to be." But as I think about it, last time I went really, really went fishing, and it wasn't like a lot of effort going into fishing. But it was. I want to say. February was the last time I was fishing this year. 
and that's like five months ago. And I do love fishing. I do enjoy fishing. I like taking people fishing more than going fishing. But it really shows you how much of a priority in my life it is. Because I actually, I've got a boat. I've got boats. I've got fishing poles. I've got, I live in South Florida. There's fishing everywhere in South Florida. All kinds of fishing. This is fishing mecca. And I, it is such a priority for me that I've been fishing, really actually fishing about three times this year, maybe two times, and that was because I took somebody fishing in February. So it really isn't something I love all that much, I guess. You ask, what do you like to do? I like to go fishing. How much? Well, enough that I did it five months ago. I have a 1971 Chevelle. It was my great-grandma's car. I have the original uh, bill of sale. I have the canceled check uh, that my granddad wrote when he bought the my great-granddad bought when he bought the car. And uh, when I was in college, uh, my dad's cousin had it, and I had the opportunity to get it from him. I bought it from him and did a little fixing on it. But it's actually in great shape. And uh, I started it. I love I love muscle cars. I love Chevy GM muscle cars. So I've got my my Chevelle. And it's a pretty nice one. It, it sounds good, runs pretty good. I'd like to do some things with it. But uh, <laughs> this last summer when I was in Kansas, I pulled it out of the shed and, and, uh, I, and uh, hosed the coat of mud off of it, that dust that just turned into mud, and um, started it, it ran great. And it was the first time I started my Chevelle in 15 years. And I... <laughs> I thought about my dad called me the other day. He says, you want to sell your car? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't really know if I want to sell it or not. Uh, how much does that car mean to me, actually? Well, it's got some, I guess, you know, sentimental storage, like sentimental hoarder value. It kind of has. I've kept it for 15 years in a garage in Kansas. But how much does that car really mean to me if the first time I started it was 15 years ago? Since the last time I started it, drove it. I drove it last summer, but that was the first time in 15 years since I pulled that car out and started it. Time flies. But really, I don't love that car that much. If you think about it. it, doesn't get a priority for me. But you know, there's just things I do, and I catch myself. Well, I spent a lot of time doing this today, and I get into it, and I, I'm all about it, and I'm, you know want to do that, that thing, whatever it is. And I realized, man, I really enjoy this because I'm spending a lot of time on it. And my friend listened to me. Oftentimes, the world, the love of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, oftentimes it isn't a major priority. Oftentimes it isn't. You know, we love something so much, but uh, oftentimes it's not something big that we love. Oftentimes it's just something dumb. Man, the, you, you find yourself researching it on the internet every single day for hours. You love it. I mean, you, it's not fishing. It's not. It's not. Uh, you know, a muscle car. It's not a hobby. It's not something you know, tangible that you're just fanatical about. It's just something dumb. And you're wasting all your time on it. You're on the internet researching it for hours every day, and you're researching it last year. And the year before that, and the year after that. And I'm just telling you something, you love it because it's what you put your time into. That's a litmus test for you. You want to know what you love, look at what you invest your time in. If you go soul winning all the time, you love soul winning, you love souls. That's what the Bible says, isn't it? He that winneth love when a souls is wise. And you go soul winning, you're a wise person, and you will also be a person that invests in that. Okay, let's let's blow through some verses here that kind of uh, support or uh, that that uh, that show us how that we're supposed to love God and practice biblical separation. Um, we're supposed to remember in verse 17 of 1 John 2, the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. If you're going to be able to practically practice, I know that's a tough thing, tough line to swallow. But if you're going to practice in a practical way biblical separation. Just remember, invest yourself, separate yourself from things that pass away. Things that you can't keep. Charlie asked in Sunday school the question about some of the judges. I can't remember those guys' names. But some of the judges that, you know, this guy had 30 sons and 30 daughters. And his, uh, what was the guy that had 70, 
70 sons? No, 30, 40, 30 sons of 40 nephews. No, 40 sons, 30 nephews. And his nephews all had their own uh, ass cult. And it's like, wow, you know, you got, you got 70 of them. And Charlie asked, well, what more would they want? I say, well, probably 71 sons in, in, a, in a cult for their son to ride. But the reality of it is, Charlie said, well, what is all that? What are all those possessions? What are all the stuff that they have? What is it to them today? And the answer is nothing. If something isn't eternal, my friend, it's the world. The world is defined by that which passes away. Even the lust passes. I'll tell you something, if a tragedy happens in your life, it will cause you to refocus in a way that will really shed light on the value of things that pass away. You ever lost somebody? And when you lost them, you realized, you know, I don't care about anything. What I cared about, I lost. What's worth caring about, I've lost. And that's what matters. Why? Because people are eternal, aren't they? And you know, oftentimes we love things that we can lose, and we don't love things that we can keep. Eternal things, doing the will of God, is something you can keep. There are rewards in heaven. It's an eternal matter when you do God's will. The Bible says, He that doeth the will of God abide a friend. Whereas the world's passing, God's will is forever. Okay, so we're not supposed to love the world because of that, and so we're supposed to be separated from the world because of it. Go over in your Bibles to James very, very quickly. If you will, please. Uh, Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. Right toward the end of your Bible. James chapter 1. I want to read uh, just a couple of verses. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Okay, now we're going to focus on the unspotted from the world because that's what's elaborated on in verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will, <coughs> excuse me, be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Friend, it's important for us to be separated from the world in the sense that we don't love the world. See, separation from the world is not loving the world. Not investing ourselves in the world. Loving God. Doing the will of God. So you can be in the world and be separated from the world by being in the will of God. And doing the will of God. And James is here talking to believers and he says that pure religion is to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. Why is that? Well, because those are eternal things. Those people that you are literally ministering to in their affliction, they're eternal. And if you ever do invest in someone's life, particularly spiritually invest in a person's life, you'll find out there's nothing more rewarding and nothing more lasting than spending your life, spending your affection, putting your love into a person. Try putting someone in a place of, of importance, investing in a person's life sometime. Mm. Try it sometime. There's nothing more rewarding, there's nothing more lasting than investing yourself in someone else's life. That's not the way the world thinks about it. Well, I want to invest in me. No, I'll invest in others. And then in verse, uh, verse 4, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Okay, so... We're supposed to be separated from the world because being identified with the world is separating us from God. My friend, the matter of separation from worldliness is a matter that has implications of whether or not we're close to God. You're close to God, you'll be far from the world. You're close to the world, you'll be far from God. That's why we don't want to have worldly churches. Well, listen, we don't need to, we, we, sh we I shouldn't say that, we, we ought not as a church to try to cater to people's lust of the world. Sometimes I've wanted to, but because it's just like, man, it just can't seem like spiritual things just don't compete. But, uh, you know, I realize, man, you just can't attract people. I, I'm, I'm fine if somebody comes to the church house for the wrong reason, aren't you? I, I don't mind if somebody comes here and they've got the wrong motive. Because they're going to be under the preaching of the Word of God, and God's Word's going to have its effect. It's quick and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It discerns 
uh, the Bible says it's, it's able to, to it's divide between the joints and the marrow and it discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the Word of God will fix the wrong motive. But you know, churches have become all about attracting people by the lust of the flesh. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Entertainment. Churches have become centers of entertainment, and literally they're judged by the quality of their entertainment. And people won't go to a church if it's not entertaining enough. I mean, the music's got to be on a certain level, it's got to be the style that they want, and that's worldliness. Entertainment is the world, the world is, is the entertainment. Uh, people want to go to church because of what it offers. What can you do for me? Can you raise my children for me? I know it's my duty, but could you raise my kids? Could you, uh, could you, you know, what kind of program do you have? What kind of, y'all have, y'all have uh, small groups that, you know, golf. I don't know why I'm picking on golf today, but there was a golf class at a church when I lived in Pensacola. I just cracked, yeah, they're having a golf. I'm like, how do you teach, you know, Sundays? They had a Sunday school golf class. And literally, it's like, hey, we're going to attract golfers to come to Sunday school class. I don't know if they got to go golfing. I guess that would maybe be a nice Sunday school class. Uh, but, you know, it's like golf, this is a class for golfers. You know? <laughs> we were um, in Tennessee and we saw a biker church a while back, motorcycle church. You know, I, 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 I'm cool. I'm a motorcycle guy. You know, I'm a biker. And uh, I, can, I can understand guys wanting to ride motorcycles, but I don't want to have biker church. First of all, bikers, yeah, never mind, I won't pick on bikers. But, uh, you know, it's kind of exclusive, isn't it? This is a church for, for bikers. You don't ride a motorcycle, you don't. How about cowboy church? Does that ever crack you up? The horse people, horse people, I think, are funny anyway. But uh, cowboy church. You know, if you're not a cowboy, you're just not welcome. That's kind of exclusive. That's kind of not really what the church is about, isn't it? It's, it's an inclusive group that excludes others. Yeah, no, not at all. That's not what a church is supposed to be. But there's an attraction in that. There are cowboy churches that are that are full. I mean, they got a lot of people. Now, you're not a cowboy, you can't go there, but they they've got this is what people like. They like horses. So we're gonna have horses church. How about holiness church? How about God? Worshiping God. How about coming into God's presence? church. It's really what ought to attract people, shouldn't it? Listen, it's, it's what we ought to use to attract people. Godliness. There's a world that is lost and being destroyed by wickedness. And you ought to be able to go into the church house and find some separation from that. If the world passed the way lust thereof, then Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world's enemy of God. Let me read some verses to you uh, while, we, while we conclude. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Uh, verse 2, the Bible says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect what it? will of God. My friend, it will either be the world or it will be the will of God. The love of the world will keep you from the will of God. It'll be the will of the world, the love of the world, or it'll be the will of God. We've seen that in a couple of uh, passages already. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you're not your own? Therefore, uh, or sorry, it's, um, I'm about to, to mix it with 1 Corinthians 13, or 2 Corinthians 3, or 3 I meant to say. Um, For you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. You belong to God. My friend, if you've been separated, you've also been bought. You've been purchased. You're a child of God. You belong to God. And separation from the world is because of ownership. And it's because of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit in us. I, I fear that God's Spirit is so quenched within most of us. I, I, if people say to me, Pastor, I don't... You know, what's, what's hearing from God like? What's it like to have the Holy Spirit of God talk to you? I can't tell you what my experience is like. It's different for you. The Holy Spirit of God speaks to you Himself. But you don't know because you love the world so much that the Spirit of God can't speak. You don't hear God talking. I don't hear God. 
I just feel like God's silent to me. I'll tell you why. You love the world. That's why. And that's what quenches the Spirit of God. 1 Peter 2.11 Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from less fleshly lusts which war against the soul. The lust of the world war against your soul. They're against your soul. They're against who you are. Your identity in Jesus Christ with His holiness. Titus 2, 11 and 12, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that we, that denying godliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Romans 13, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. That's Romans 13, 13 and 14. Man, we're all about the lusts of the flesh. This is what I want. This is what, this is what people want. This is what the world wants. My friend, it is an absolute contradiction of God's will in your life. And we need to separate from the lusts of the flesh, from the world. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, Galatians 5.16. How do you do it? How do you actually, practically, not love the world? Well, you've got to, you've got to invest in things that matter. I use the illustration of my car a little bit ago, my, my 71 Chevelle. When I was in college, uh, when in the summertime, I worked in a mechanic shop, and I'll tell you what happened after hours at work. That car got pulled in the shop and put on the lift. A lot. I was always working on something. Doing something to it. You know, I will put a shift kit in the transmission. I will put a different engine in with a little more horsepower. Or I'm going to, always doing something with it. Always messing with something on it. You know, I, I did a disc brake conversion on the front end, but after hours, I was just always messing with my car. And after I mess with it, I get out and drive it and tune it. Try to get it to run better, be a little faster, and uh, just work on different things with it. I pro probably forgot I had it for a couple of years. There are probably a couple of years when that car never entered my mind in the last 15 years. It's just a fact. This last year, though, I've thought about it quite a bit. Matter of fact, I've spent time on the internet researching, you know, like, you know, how to build an LS1 engine or a. Um, or a, a good, what's the engine that's in the ZR1 Corvette? I'd like to build that engine and put it in my Chevelle. LT. No, it's not an LT. Uh, that's, LT1 is the, uh, I can't, I think it's a LS9 or something like that. Uh, whatever it is. I think it's an LS9. But regardless, you know, how can I build an LS9 and uh, put that in my Corvette? And then I'd have to change the whole drivetrain because it'd be too much horsepower for the transmission, so I'd have to go. And then I'd have to change the rear end and, and then I'd have to, you know, uh, probably strengthen the frame so it wouldn't twist the frame and all the things you'd have to do. And I looked at that and researched that in the last year. Why? Because, because I, I got my car out and drove it. And it made me want to mess with it a little bit. I want to give you something helpful here. I want this to be practical. Do you know how it is when you're just full of the lust of the flesh? I just want to do this and this and this and this. And you realize, I don't want to do anything godly. I just don't have the desires for spiritual things. I just I love the world. I do. And it's maybe not something wicked like adultery or fornication or something that hurts people, but I just love the world. Just love it, love it, love it, love it. You what know, makes you love the world? How much you invest in it. The more I drive that car, the more I want to work on it. The more I want to do stuff to it. And I'm not saying that's evil or wicked or whatever. I think there's things that God created for our pleasure, and those are perfectly fine. But we're oftentimes imbalanced. We'll head off to go get an auto part early in the morning before the, you know, so we can get there before traffic or something instead of read our Bible. <laughs> and we need to do this because it's got to be done. And we're always prioritizing things and just giving it God's place. You know how you get the desires of the Spirit? Get into the Word of God. Take your Bible for a ride sometime. Test drive it. Get in the Word of God and study and meditate on it. Get, some, get a spiritual truth. 
This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now you walk in the Spirit, get in the Spirit. That's how. Try it a little bit. And when you get a little bit, you'll want a little more. It's amazing when I read my Bible how much more Bible I want to read. This morning, I don't know why. I don't know what took me to it. I wanted to, I had a hard time in Sunday school class not reading Lamentations. I just, I've been uh, studying Jeremiah and there's some things I want to study in Lamentations. And I had a hard time disciplining myself to stay with judges and not, you know, like sneak over to Lamentations and read Lamentations because Charlie's so boring. So I'm kind of just kidding. <laughs> That's not true. It was not boring this morning. Uh, but you know what? I mean, it's just like I had a desire to study. And there's something I'm studying in Lamentations. And uh, something I'm trying to learn. And I uh, wanted to study it. And I've got a desire for it. You know where I got that desire? By reading Jeremiah. I, Pastor, I, there's just, I have no desire to read the Word of God. Well, read it. I have no desire to do the will of God. Well, do it. And when you walk in the Spirit, you'll feed the Spirit. And you won't fulfill the lust. The flesh will get weak and the Spirit will get stronger. And pretty soon, if you start doing what you know God wants in your life, all of a sudden you'll start wanting to do what God wants in your life. The desire will be there. The reward of it will be there. And all of a sudden, the love for the world will be taken out of your heart withdrawn from your heart. We as believers are called to be separate. My friend, that's not a negative thing. Separation from the world is, I hate the world. The world's bad. Well, of course it is. Separation from the world is, really, I'm identified with God. And my friend, when you come to understand what it is to be made holy and to go from being unclean and really only deserving God's judgment to being God's child and being made holy holy, called to be holy, all of a sudden you realize that your call to separation is a really positive thing. And that practically, practiced in a practical sense, man, separation is the most positive thing that will ever happen to you. Start identifying things that are the world in your life. And just try replacement. You know, that's the lust of the flesh. That's the pride of life. I'm going to replace it with. And you replace it with what God wants for you spiritually. My friend, what will happen? I'll tell you what will happen. The Spirit will grow in you. The Spirit will begin to speak to you and your Spirit will grow and you'll have more desire. And pretty soon you'll find yourself serving God and doing things that are eternal. I can't tell you what it's like. You've got to experience it. I can't tell you the joy and the contentment, the satisfaction, the fulfillment that comes from being separated God's way. You have to experience it. It isn't negative. It isn't, I, I'm better than them, or I'm different than them, or they're no good, or that's... No, my friend, it's all positive. It's, I've been made holy. And I've been called to be holy. And now I'm separated. And I'm going to live and act like what I am. And you'll be amazed at the joy, the fulfillment, and the eternal ramifications of a simple doctrine like biblical separation carried out in practice. Father, thank You for what we've learned today. Lord, I pray that You would help us in our hearts and our minds to desire what we've been given a taste of from Your Word today. Help us to want more of it. And Lord, help us by Your Spirit to see how much the world influences us and how much the lust of the world has gotten to us. And Lord, I pray that You would just deliver us from it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.